You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Good morning, everybody. Um, although I should be saying good day, I think, because in other parts of the world it is earlier morning and in other parts of Europe, maybe it's later morning. Um, but welcome to everybody. Uh, this is the latest in a series of uh, webinar events uh, that's been organised by De Montfort University's International Network in Criminal Justice. Uh, this is a network of universities, but also of criminal justice organisations. And one defining feature of this is our belief that uh, theory uh, as developed in universities should be relevant to, to practice. But at the same time, uh, practice puts theory to test, as well as providing empirical data on which scholarship may be built. So a defining characteristic of our network is to bring theory and practice together in, in synergy. And today's topic is a matter of conspicuous importance to all of us in this respect. It's essential to ideas of research and teaching, but also in criminal justice practice. And this is the first of two webinars that, where this topic will be discussed. And our title is Decolonization, Cultures and Communities. De Montfort is among those universities that are increasingly recognizing that our approaches to learning, teaching and research commonly assume Western, European or Anglo-American perspectives, which represent an incomplete and perhaps sometimes distorted understanding of topics and the way in which they may be explored. And at the same time, many criminal justice organisations are working through the challenges that they must meet if they are to fulfil their responsibility to deliver their best practice to everyone. Sometimes practices and institutions are organised in ways that suppose a standard case. But as the late Barbara Hudson used to say, difference is the standard case. There are obvious overlaps between the projects of decolonization and anti-discrimination, although they're not identical undertakings. So to discuss, to discuss this topic, uh, we have with us uh, Kashika Patel, who's the Interim Deputy PVC for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, at De Montfort University. Jason Pandia Wood, who's Dean of Arts and Social Sciences at uh, the University of Nottingham in Malaysia. And Brian Stout, who's Dean of Arts and Social Sciences, Professor of Social Work at Western Sydney University in Australia. We also have on our panel, uh, Vivian Gearan, who's adjunct uh, assistant professor in the School of Social Work and Social Policy at Trinity College, Dublin and Dr. Chijoki Nwalozi, who's the Senior Lecturer in Criminology and Criminal Justice at De Montfort University. Dialogue is not going to be an easy thing to achieve except among the panel members themselves, but we're hoping that people in the audience will participate by typing in to the chat uh, on the YouTube. And if you have questions, and I do hope that you have, uh, we will... Uh, refer those to the panel and, uh, and respond as, as best we can. Uh, do feel free to tweet about this and we have a hashtag set up or we'll have a hashtag set up maybe uh, uh, so that uh, we can promote the event as, as we go along in the familiar way. Um, I think that's all that I need to say by introduction so I wonder if I can invite Kashika to, uh, to, to start us off with her presentation. Thank you so much, Kashika. I was just about to say good morning, but I'll say good day to everybody. Um, thank you very much, Rob. So I'm going to kick off by sharing my screen. And I am looking for nods from my fellow colleagues to say that they can see my screen. Excellent, right. So, a little bit of uh, introduction. So my topic, I'm going to be opening up with what is meant by decolonization. 
And as Rob has identified, I am the Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor for Equality, Diversity, Inclusion. The De Montfort University started a project about four years ago, looking very specifically at something in the UK um, referenced as the Black Asian Minority Ethnic Awarding Gap. And uh, we did two years of that project. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, in, my, in the next 15 minutes that you'll be listening to me. Um, and that led to um, the project that we've been running since November 2019 called Decolonizing DMU. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we got to Decolonizing DMU. And then I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the concept of decolonizing the curriculum and the concept of decolonizing or decolonization in teaching, learning, scholarship, then particularly practice. Um, so I thought I would start with just a little bit of a context. Um, sorry, should have shared that with you right at the beginning as I was talking through. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'll start with a little bit about my context and my positioning um, and then about a little bit about the awarding gap. And then um, some of the evaluation that we got from um, the first part of our project when we were looking at the awarding gap. Um, and then I'll move into criminal justice. And then I'm hoping that you'll see how this all comes back round into the circle, certainly for me in my practice background, um, having come into academia as a second career and how decolonizing, but also the touching on building an anti-racist university all comes together. So I thought I'd give you a little bit about why am I doing this and why, why am I um, particularly passionate about this topic? Um, so there's a lot of titles right at the beginning when you had my name and titles and labels tell a story about an individual's profession, um, you know, what they've achieved and what they've done, but also our narrative and our story tell a lot about our positioning, our positionality and what we understand and what we do and how we go about learning, teaching, and how we go about practice as professionals. So I thought a little bit about myself might help you to see what, what my positioning is in this field of decolonizing. So I'm a woman of Indian heritage and I was born in Africa, came to the UK, came to England as a refugee, worked in social work, qualified as a social worker and practiced in youth justice and child protection for about 17 years before moving into academia. And I predominantly worked within the fields of uh, care, children's care, education and the criminal justice settings. And based in Leicester, my service user group was predominantly Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, young people. In my social work training, I was educated. My training was dominated by all white educators. I didn't have a single person of color who was one of my educators. In practice, my peers in the fields of education, care, and criminal justice were people that looked like me, who I related to in terms of my culture, my identity. Um, but the senior managers in all the time that I was in practice were predominantly white and mostly male. And the drivers and leaders, when I mean drivers, I'm talking about people and leaders in the criminal justice agencies that I worked with were also predominantly white and male. But my personal experiences um, resonated a lot with my service users of being stopped and searched, of um, particularly being stopped and searched when I was with male friends and relatives who looked like me and experiences of racism as a refugee family, memories of being here and having my mom's sari pulled and being spat at and in the education system about um, the way I spoke and the words that I used in my promotions. Many a time I'd had some interesting feedback when I was either successful or not successful. And in my practice, certainly going into police stations as an appropriate adult or going into prisons, uh, young offenders institutions, going to see the young people I was working with. So that's kind of my context and my narrative. And that kind of centers the work that I do and the positions that I come from when I drive forward. But when I came to university, when I started working at De Montfort University, one of the things that struck me, uh, or the trigger I would say for me, were the headlines that continued in the press every October or November, which looked at the Black Asian Minority Ethnic Awarding Gap. Um, and there were headlines like the ones I've put up on the screen now about the shame of the awarding gap um, for black and minority um, ethnic students. And what does that mean? So the awarding gap references the difference between the proportion of 
top degrees, so clusters first or two ones, achieved by white students and Black Asian minority ethnic students. And the latest data that we have for the 1920 graduates is there is an overall gap. So overall, Black Asian minority ethnic students are 13% less likely to achieve a first or two one than their white peers. And then you break that down from that BAME overarching category, you break that down, you can see a significant difference between the different ethnicities, but still a gap. And for me, that was a challenge. That was an issue. And um, so I was had the opportunity to work with five other universities to look at um, what was all that about and what could we do about it. So that was the externally funded project that I was part of. We at De Montfort called it the Freedom to Achieve project. And we did two years worth of that and came up with evaluation, talking to staff and students and looking at the impact. And we realized there was a lot of going on in the sector and globally around the curriculum and decolonizing a curriculum. And, and is that the answer to, every, to everything? Um, and what we found from our evaluation from this project was that it's, it, it, the curriculum is absolutely key and important, but it's much bigger than that. It's about a whole institution approach. While I'm talking, I'd like, I'm talking about the higher education system, but in my mind, I'm also considering how this impacted in practice, in criminal justice, in the settings that, that we will practice in. So this was some of the, the feedback. We did a number of co-creation sessions with staff and students at program level. And these are the things that they said to us. It was like, well, you know, we have this awarding gap. We've used some methods as part of the funded project to baseline for people's starting positions so that we could try and work out what's going, moving beyond the student deficit model where it's the student's fault. What other factors are there that lead to this? And the feedback from staff and students, fairly consistent. In the, in the blue bubbles, you can see the key areas, but within that, role models, uh, improved communication, cultural examples, learning resources that were diverse, importance of feeling of belonging, cultural inclusivity, perceptions of an inherent white culture, um, practical experiences, cultural re relevant support. It was really interesting when all of this came out because there was very few, uh, very specific references to the curriculum, but much more about a holistic approach of the experiences that somebody had, the support that they received and how they felt that they belonged and their Cultures, their stories and narratives were recognised in what they were learning. And did that therefore inhibit them if it wasn't there or would it have supported them if it was there in their learning and in their achievement? So for the institution, we looked at decolonising the curricula and the university. Now, there's the campaign Roads Must Fall, which started in South Africa and was picked up by Oxford. And one of the things the campaign talked about is what is excluded from my curriculum? By whom? And why? And what is the purpose of my education? And I found that particularly interesting because I thought about my experiences when I was training to be a social worker. What did I learn and whose lens through that and whose lens was it that I was learning through? Was it my own or was it through the people that were educating me? So the content of university knowledge for me, and when you look around curricula, certainly in the UK, remains centered in the Eurocentric Foundation. We did a lot of analysis of the, of the programs in our institution. Knowledge, which is imparted, centers the global north as the norm. And writers of the global north deemed as creators of true knowledge. We looked at our curriculum. We looked at the resources that students were being given. And we looked at where the knowledge was being centered. And that was certainly very true of what we were delivering. And when we look at the criminal justice practice, we look at any practice areas when you're being taught something that becomes or seems to be normalized, are you looking through it from a different lens? Or do you only look through it from a different lens when you're in your home environment or in your own community environment? And does that filter in when you're in practice? So we looked at our institution of structures, cultures, and practices. So we were looking at understanding the impacts of racism. So as a service user and the impacts of racism are the people that are working with you and the education that we're providing for the professionals who are going to work with these with, with people within the criminal justice system, looking at and understanding the impacts of everyday racism before they enter the criminal justice system, but whilst they're in it. We felt that talking about whiteness and privilege was really important to centre that, to understand that, but also to understand that from the perception of our white allies, to be able to talk about and understand what does this actually mean and what does privilege actually mean? 
decolonizing was more than just the curriculum. It was about yourself and the mind as well as the institution. And we felt it was really important that we were able to hear narratives and stories about the sense of not belonging being a key factor in, in how students learn and how they progress and therefore what they're learning as well. So as we moved into decolonizing DMU from freedom to achieve, we were trying to work out how we talk about this as an institution. We came up with something that we called a working definition, and it was really just trying to work out where this was coming from. We talked about racial inequality in Britain originating from colonialism. We talked about shifting the burden and conversation away from one of deficit and blame and shame. So what we, what we didn't want to do was center on individual people, but we wanted to talk about recognizing uh, racial inequalities being built over centuries on the dominant Western and Northern hemispheres perceptions. And we felt that the scale of the challenge was running deep and it needed to be examined in every part of the norms of university life. And therefore, when you mirror that across into practice, how would that translate? It's a massive project. Um, so we had to split it up into little bits. So this is kind of this, I just wanted to see if you to see a visual of how we've broken this up and how each of those what look like individual areas do interconnect and we work through each of these but it's a massive piece of work which um, requires the institution to look at itself and for staff and students to also examine their positioning within the institution within their teaching and learning and then within what they learn and how they take that into practice whether that be criminal justice practitioners nurses pharmacists architects etc we felt that culturally we needed to look at uh, morally bold language. Um, so the, the language of decolonizing, and I know you know panel members have come from slightly different perspectives, um, and the language of decolonizing has been contested within the institution about, well, why are we using the language of decolonizing? It can mean different things to different people, and through the context of the process of decolonization in different countries, it means different things as well. So why are we using that language? But when you look at the the idea around decolonizing a curriculum, there is a space and place for it to be, to be um, discussed in, in kind of understanding the norms of what we're taught and how we're taught, certainly in the UK. And we also felt that using language that was quite bold and controversial opened up the conversations. It required people to have that debate with us. And that, we felt, enabled us to progress looking at what we teach and how we're preparing our professionals for the future. So for me, decolonizing is seen as a movement. And I particularly, I put this quote out from Decolonizing the University. Um, and I particularly like the quote, decolonizing movement needs to understand its position as responding to live issues of inequality, colonialism and oppression, rather than just being a matter of legacies or unearthing historical accounts. To do this work in the university is to dig where you are and where you have access, which is why we have to decolonize our institution, our university. But also in when you're working in practice in the institutions that we're working, whichever profession, criminal justice, let's, you know, currently, um, what are you looking at? Where are you looking? What is happening within your own place and space that you work? And to enter the university as a space, as a transformative force to connect what is happening inside the institution to outside and to utilize its resources in the interests of social justice, which is particularly important, I think, because what we teach our students, how our students learn and understand the world and the potential peers and service users that they'll be working with and understanding people's context, narratives, positionality, and what is seen as where the knowledge is created, where the power is held in the global North is really important within our, our institutional university institutional settings to be able to ensure that our future practitioners come out with a perspective that is more globally relevant rather than narrowly focused on the global north. So for me, looking particularly at criminal justice scholarship and practice, in criminal justice scholarship, education and training, and of course, practice, what, where is our theoretical and practice concepts? Are they within the global north? Are they centered around the global north theories? Um, do we talk about and understand, and we do talk about this because I know that we talk about the movement of peoples. We talk about global and international communities. When I joined De Montfort University, I worked with Brian Stout. And one of the, one of the modules I was given, I don't think, don't know if Brian will even remember this, but one of the modules I was given was international perspectives. Um, and 
you know, it was a fantastic module talking about international perspectives of criminology. And we talked about the different perceptions of crime and criminal justice and the practice of criminal justice in different countries. And for me, that was kind of like the opening door of where, where do we center this knowledge? And, and myself brought up in this country, learning, my education was based on the global north and all my learning and, and all my learning was based on the global north theories and practice. My personal experiences were very different to that. So when it came to bringing those together, it was a real interesting challenge of this is what I'm living, yet this is what I'm learning, and they don't necessarily always connect. So I think institutions, university institutions are in a really strong position to help our future professionals in criminal justice to understand the much wider context beyond the global north. So I've put in that last bullet point, decolonized considerations versus dominance of the knowledge of the global north. And I think for me, if I take it back to the beginning where I talked about myself, I think it's really important to hear the narratives, to hear the narratives of our service users in the criminal justice system, as well as our students within higher education, to acknowledge the experiences and to value the voices. So if you have a sense of belonging or do you have a sense of alienation, if somebody is, is, is so I talked right at the beginning about stop and search. My path and the path of many of my family members could have been very different. The number of times that we were stopped and searched, the number of times that we were picked on because of being refugees, our path could have been very different. We could have ended up being stereotyped and stigmatized and gone down the criminal just into the criminal justice route rather than working in the criminal justice system. So that sense of belonging and alienation could take you either way. And it's really important that that is understood within practice and how we teach that within universities when we're, we're preparing our professionals for the future. The impact of what we teach and what is seen to be important and whose stories and whose narratives are seen to be important. For me, that's decolonizing in an institution, understanding what is censored and who is heard. So you need to consider the alternative realities or norms for our scholarship, our training and our practice. So for me, as criminal justice practitioners and as criminal justice educators, what is your norm? What is your reality and what lens do you practice through? And how does that connect to the students in your classroom or your service users in front of you in the courts, in the prisons, in the care system, in the education system? For me, decolonizing is about understanding that centering, that broader global majority narrative experience um, and moving not away, but moving to building together the global north and the global south to have a much stronger understanding of peoples so that when we're practicing and we're educating, we're educating around a global majority rather than a global minority. And I think I have come to the end of what I wanted to say. I've just got a little bit up there and I'm sure this has been recorded. So if people wanted to find out a little bit more about what we're doing at the university, there's some information there. Um, but that's that's my um, presentation over. I will stop sharing my screen so that I can come back over to you, Rob. Thank you so much, Kashika. That's a fabulous way of beginning these uh, these two uh, webinars uh, and a, a really rich overview. Um, can I throw the questions? Over, uh, well, th uh, throw to the panel uh, or offer to the panel. Invite the panel. Uh, to reflect or ask questions about what Kashika has just said, uh, reflect on it or comment. We have already a really good question that's come in from uh, someone from the audience, and I'll put that in a moment to you, if I may. But can any immediate thoughts or reflections on what uh, Kashika has just said? Jason. Hi, Kashika. Thank you. That was a, a really interesting, engaging and um, thought-provoking uh, opener. I just, uh, I was struck by one of the things you said uh, as the findings from the feedback from uh, uh, the focus groups and the discussions where you were saying, am I right, that actually uh, people weren't talking a lot about the curriculum. And I just wondered what your reflections on that were and, and whether there, there's something underneath that. Yeah, uh, we were quite surprised in the early stages of doing the work that, that 
people weren't talking about the curriculum, students weren't talking about the curriculum. And when we delved a little bit deeper, the reason they weren't talking about the curriculum is their view was as an institution, as a university, an institution of higher education, we should be doing that automatically. It shouldn't be the students telling us that our curriculum doesn't represent the, you know, the, the people in our university. They felt that 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 we needed to be doing that automatically and that the other things that they were raising were things that maybe we weren't focusing on and they wanted to bring those to our attention, which I found really interesting because actually when you then talk to the academics, the academics weren't necessarily thinking about the curriculum in, the, in that way. You know, the students were going, well, you should be doing it. So that, that was really interesting. So we didn't take curriculum off the table, but it did mean that students had a particular expectation already when they were coming to us as a higher education institution, you should be looking much more broadly and not on such a narrow focus. So, yeah, that was an eye opener for, for many of us on the project. We weren't expecting that. It's fascinating. And just kind of it made me reflect on an experience of uh, colleagues in a sociology department who were looking at reading lists and who was making up the reading list. And this particular approach was taken from the perspective of gender. And actually, nobody had ever considered that something like 90% of the reading list was made up of male writers, right? It was actually just, it wasn't a conscious, uh, um, I guess that's what I'm kind of interested in. It wasn't at the forefront of educators' minds to even engage in that. In terms and, of that's, that. and that's the difference. With the students, they were already assuming it was on our minds and, and that we were doing something about it, especially as we started talking about decolonizing. Um, but I also found, we also found out from the students that they had their own ways of decolonizing their own materials. So a couple of examples was a WhatsApp group that students had. Um, it, was in our, in, it was in our biomedical sciences. They had a, their own WhatsApp group where it came, ac came across deep by default, where somebody had come across an author that had an Indian name. And he just went, oh, my God, oh, my God, he sounds he's, he's got a name similar to mine. And he what's up the whole group. And then it just started with people looking at different materials that were available from around the world. And they started building up their own. So they felt that they were doing something. They felt that the university should automatically be doing something. But there were these other more institutional things that the university were also just missing out on and that they wanted us to be aware of that they felt these were important as well. Um, Ryan. Yeah, I just wanted, uh, as a great presentation, thank you, um, um, Kashik, and I do remember that, that module. <laughs> um, the, um, the, uh, um, but I wanted to pick up particularly on your reference to South Africa. Um, as, as you know, I, I, I lived in South Africa and I taught at a university there and I followed what was going on there really closely. Um, and what was one of the really interesting things about decolonization in South Africa was it very quickly moved outside, as you just said, um, a curriculum conversation and it very quickly moved from roads must fall and, and that roads must fall linked initially to statues to many things, including a university named after um, Cecil Rhodes to to a broader conversation about what education was for and who education was for. And a very and, and, and some of the, the, the protests became there were protests that, 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 that turned into um, protest marches and and and, and turn, turned um, into major social movements and and roads must fall became fees must fall um, and that then ended up in a change in government policy and and, and uh, a widening of access to to education in South Africa and I just wondered from your perspective of what's going on there at De Montfort and Leicester and, and even in the UK is is there a sense of that moving more broadly of, of the idea that you you start talking about curriculum and then suddenly you get into very, or very quickly get into conversations about unfairness of structures within society. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make sure I was not mute for a minute then. I'd be muting myself. No, you're absolutely right. The, the decolonizing curriculum movement has followed it's certainly the Oxford model. It's still working on getting rid of the Cecil Rhodes statue, which has just been said that they're not going to get rid of the Cecil Rhodes statue at, at Oxford. But the conversations across institutions with all the work that I'm doing 
the curriculum is still really important. And depending on where you are on the spectrum of this work, you're either still at the beginning of just looking at your curriculum or the student body and the staff body, actually, because in a lot of places and in South Africa, it started off as a student movement. And in lots of institutions, it's a student movement. But what we found is where it's just a student movement, it's not getting traction and it and it and it it moves into other things where students are feeling disenfranchised, like the fees. But where you've got a joint movement of staff and students, curriculum still plays a very important part, but it is moving into uh, opportunities. It's moving into social mobility. It's moving up into the words that we're using in this country around levelling up, and that's using our government's language here. Um, but it's moving away from just the curriculum and more about opportunities, equality, and I certainly from this time last year, the Black Lives Matter movement, the spotlighting on race and racism and anti-blackness has certainly generated a momentum to look broader than just your curriculum and look at the structures and processes that would have inherent systemic or institutional racism and how we need to break those down. So it starts in one place and moves much further as it did in South Africa. I wonder if this might, oh, Vivian, please come in. Yeah, wonderful presentation, Kushik. I really, really enjoyed it, although enjoyed may not be the right word because I just found images bubbling up all over the place and questions and so on. And one of the questions I had for myself was where to start? I mean, all the the points you made, you know, made a, a huge amount of sense. And uh, I was left with wondering wh where, where to start, whether we're talking about universities or the criminal justice system. And I was conscious as well. These, and these are just some of the many thoughts that, that struck me. But I was, I was conscious that we in Ireland uh, feel well colonized after several hundred years domination by Britain. But we don't tend to see ourselves as colonizers, particularly in the sense that, that you're describing. Um, and uh, with many questions about how we, how we do that and the whole, you know, the whole process and the, the circularity of it uh, struck me. And to some extent, I felt that there were, there were large things that would need to be taken on. I, you know, when you described the project, the decolonizing project, if you like, at the Montford, it was, or it is, as you say, uh, so huge and has so many parts to it. And then there are also small issues, if you like, that need to be addressed. And uh, I was left again with the with the thought that asking the question and opening it up is a, is a good place to start. Uh, and then dealing with issues, whether they're large are apparently small, but even the small ones are not without their impact. So thanks again for a, for a great presentation. Very thought-provoking is not the word. Thanks. Thanks, Vivian. I will say that it's a... Uh, I, I didn't go into this with my eyes closed. I, didn't, I don't think I went into this naively, but it's... Um, even the, the, as you call the smaller things, as we've gone through, one of the people in the chat, when the co conversations is James Tangent. James has been to a number of the sessions that we've run on decolonizing at De Montfort. And even some of the smallest conversations have generated massive debates around what is decolonizing? Why are we doing it? Who are we centering? Where's my place as a white person? And how do I be an ally? And why should I be an ally? And the, 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 the you know, the, the, the race theories have come up, um, you know, conversations around um, the importance of allyship. Uh, every little thing that you can imagine has come up as a conversation. And sometimes it's having a conversation and sometimes it's um, generating a debate where you have no idea where it's going to go, but you have to trust to let it happen. Because if you don't have the conversation, you're closing down a whole group of people who was quite, who are not comfortable with this. And I, when I do things at the university, I talk about uncomfortable conversations. And this generates, has generated and continues to generate a lot of uncomfortable conversations across the spectrum of peoples. It's not just uncomfortable conversations for white people who, are, who feel that, you know, are, are we all being called racist, which is not what this is about. But also from Black Asian minority ethnic people who are saying, actually, you know, this is doing a lot, potentially could be doing damage to us because of impacts on focusing on who we are and what we're doing when people don't want to do that. So it's a whole spectrum of debates, conversations, un uncomfortable uh, conversations that are right to have, but difficult to have. Can I just jump in as chair uh, for a moment, please, just to um, try and keep us within time. 
we've got some really good questions that I don't want to get lost. Uh, and Kashika, you mentioned the name of, of James Tangan, and James has come in uh, as is his custom with some really perceptive questions. Um, one of which is here we are trying to cultivate new forms of knowledge and to decenter uh, Anglo uh, and American perspectives. Meanwhile, uh, very often the university is being judged on the basis of, of established metrics that don't necessarily acknowledge or recognize that, that, that change of focus. I hope I haven't misrepresented James. I haven't just read out his words. But uh, is there a potential uh, difficulty there for universities saying to people who evaluate our work, we don't do it in that way anymore. We're trying to do it differently. And is there a, a cost and, uh, uh, in making those attempts? It's a, it's a really, really good point that James Tangent has made. And James is, is, I know, talking from the experiences of the metrics that we are judged on as, as a university in the UK. I'm not familiar of how, it's, how it is in other parts of the world. But um, when we first started this work, yes, the, the, the metrics were actually part of a business case. And, and to open up these types of debates, um, you, have to have, you have to have the momentum from the top. And often talking about race, talking about decolonizing, talking about uncomfortable things, it's very easy for people at the top to close that down. But when you present a business case, and actually I found the metrics as a really useful business case to say, at the moment, look at our awarding gap. If we were to close that gap, our metrics would look better and we would move up the league tables. And so I was able to get traction that way. And across the sector, that's happening. However, as we've moved over the last three years and People have become much more aware of the importance of the values and morals around this work. It's just morally wrong that we've got this awarding gap. And that actually students are looking at us. Students are looking at the gaps, looking not just at the, uh, the, the BAME awarding gap, but there's the disabled students awarding gap, the mature students awarding gap and, and different gaps. And when you look at it like that, there's actually now, I would say, a critical mass of awareness of, of scholars, of educators, and of managers who are aware that actually there is a, a values and morals based reason why you do this. And therefore people like Office for Students in the UK and Universities UK are now beginning to support this work. But also there is the business case around it, because if you're improving outcomes for people, more students will come to your university, you get better outputs, you'll move up the league table, that old cycle. So it started off as a problem, but we're actually being able to utilize that metrics model to enable us to get funding and move forward. So, you know, we've been able to turn it around on itself, starting to turn it around on itself a little. Thank you very much. Uh, James has asked another question, which is another, I think, really interesting and perceptive one, um, asking whether there's a, ref a role for what he refers to as a refusal in criminal justice practice. So when, it, when personnel come to recognise that some of their habits and customs and routines are actually harmful, but they are still working within an agency that hasn't yet caught up with that. Um, how, how is that to be expressed? And linked to that, uh, how are those universities involved in vocational training able to empower practitioners in training to give them the confidence and the authority uh, to, to hold that principal position? I think it starts with the universities. Um, certainly at this moment in time, I think we're in a place where if we're very conscious about our vocational programs and conscious of what we're delivering in those programs and who we're delivering to, so what are the demographics of our different vocational programs? So let's take examples of what do our policing provision look like? What do the demographics of that student body look like? Are we encouraging diversity there? And then within our curricula, are we challenging? Are we talking about things like the McPherson report, the Scarman report? You know, as we go through all of those um, elements around criminal justice, race reviews. Are we teaching these? Are we talking about these? Are we equipping our students with the knowledge to be able to challenge constructively when they are in practice? I don't think we are, to be honest. And I think that's the shift that we need to make. So I think it's important that we work with our partners. And I think that is a challenge. So the... We st I still come back to there's the business reason why we try we persuade our partners to look at the curricula and how that should change. Like the College of Policing 
What are we doing with them and what can we influence there? It's not an easy conversation. And, and I think we're far away from a place where we would like to be. But I think universities have got a very strong position because we've got, we, we, we're training and delivering um, outcomes for the future professionals of the criminal justice system. So we're in a very strong position here, but it's how we're able to do that with partnerships with the, our criminal justice providers. I don't have the answer, but I do know that our, our practitioners are looking at that. Um, it's a, it's, it, there are barriers there which will take time to overcome, but I think it's a question of keep chipping away at what we teach, who we're teaching, and how we diversify our student body that are going to go into that profession. OK, thank you very much, Kashika. So, I mean, it takes knowledge, doesn't it? But it also takes uh, ethical commitment and and often courage uh, to to do uh, to hold by what we think are the right things to do. Um, Jason, if you'll bear with us just a second before I pass to you, there's another very fascinating question that's come in from Anne Burrell, um, who thanks you for your presentation, Kashika, and asks, um, is there more to say about the communities of practice and the allies uh, that help us to develop this agenda? So in your answering the last question, you spoke about liaison with police and with other organisations. Uh, is there anything to say about how those alliances uh, can be cultivated? Yeah, I think there, there are two sets of allies. Your allies in the university um, and having a community of practice within the university where you can talk and share experiences and hear about good practice and find out how to do things differently. So we have that set up in the institution. And then there's the allies external to the institution and within practice. And, um, and again, that boils down to how we work with our partners and, and having the integration of, of practitioners delivering the vocational training within the institution, which we do quite a lot of. So as those people who are practitioners and start working in your institution to deliver sessions, it becomes a culture that this is what we're looking at and this is how we deliver. And then working with the, the commissioners is often the case of what, and I keep coming back to this and I don't know whether, you know, rightly or wrongly, it is, does fall down to the business model. So if you did look at policing, for example, you know, we can see the, that there is some awareness with the adverts in the UK about diversifying the police force. But to diversify the police force, you need to attract those students in. So it's about diversifying our student body. So I use that business model um, as a lever to get our allies in the communities and in the criminal justice partnerships to understand the model that we're using. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend it's easy because it's not. We have just a couple more questions and I'm going to uh, slip them in. Um, James, being the honourable scholar that uh, he is, uh, wants us to notice that the term refusal was one that he uh, he borrowed from Angela Last in a book on decolonising the university. Uh, but Jagdish uh, we, uh, Chauhan, who's also from De Montfort, uh, ask a good question, um, which it's a, I think this is the time for it. It's a little bit parochial. It's a little bit close to home, but we could generalise it. Uh, not everyone uh, watching will be aware that uh, there have been discussions going on about whether De Montfort University should change its name. And the, the reason for thinking in this way is because uh, it is an association with Simon de Montfort, um, who was uh, notorious for his anti-Semitism. And just as uh, Oxford University and Oriel College have wondered about their association with uh, Cecil Rhodes, uh, de Montfort is wondering about whether Simon de Montfort is someone with whom they should declare their association and uh, by implication. So... Any brief reflections on that, but but brief, please, because I don't want to go too dark, too far too into this very specific and local one. It, it's not local, is it? It, it has a wider bearing. Um, so forgive me, Jagdish, I wasn't wanting to bat it away as, as that. But it, uh, if uh, I could invite anyone on the panel to to answer that. I mean, I will say, it's, I think it's uh, from a spotlight of, of, of the sorts of things that 
Brian was talking about earlier that happened in South Africa, the things that have happened with Colston and the statue there. There is, it's the right time to have the right conversation, but it needs to be a conversation with our staff, students, and our local community because it's not just De Montfort University. We have De Montfort Hall, we have De Montfort Street, we have De Montfort Statue. So there is, it's a broader conversation, and it's the right thing to be doing to have the conversation and it should be a community decision it shouldn't just be a university decision and that's where we are with that at the moment and we should not pretend uh, that our history was other than what it was okay uh, I think at this point uh, with the panel's permission I'd like to draw a line under that uh, conversation for now although of course there's continuity between the presentations and pass over to Jason who's going who working in in, in uh, formerly working in the United Kingdom, but now in a very different part of the world, will have a perspective on it that I certainly would lack. So over to you, Jason, thank you. Thank you, I'm unmuted, which is a good start. Um, I really enjoyed that presentation, Kashika. Thank you very much for kickstarting um, us on this, this discussion. And what I'm going to do today uh, in my slot is reflect on and make some personal reflections on the question of decolonization in a Malaysian context. So I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences um, at University of Nottingham, Malaysia. I started the job exactly a year ago on 1st of June, but uh, due to COVID-19 and all of that drama didn't actually arrive into Malaysia until August last year. So to set up in the same way Kashika did that fantastic sort of opener as to, you know, your perspective, where you come from and why that matters. I too need to kind of set some out uh, at the beginning, but I label these a bit more as a caution because what you're going to be hearing is through the lens of someone who is new to the country, despite having been here, I think my flight in to live in Malaysia was my 21st flight here uh, in three years. So I'm quite familiar with the country, but I'm, I'm new, I'm white. And being white gives you a particular perspective of the world, all the history, the legacy, uh, both in terms of how I see the world and how I'm seen within it. And accompanying that is the privileged position I occupy. I read a fascinating article about six months ago by an economist over here who was talking about how language changes depending on who you're talking about. So I'm not an immigrant, I'm an expat. People who work in houses aren't uh, servants, they're helpers, and so on and so forth. I'm from the former colonial country, and there's a legacy to that as well, sometimes spoken and unspoken. So the ways in which I'm treated, depending on what agency organisation I'm interacting with, depending on the age of the person I'm with, uh, will, uh, will change all the time. And there's, there's lots of that sort of legacy that underpins those interactions. I'm from a privileged institution. I'm in a university that is genuinely international. It's genuinely global. We recruit our staff and our students from around the world. Um, actually, the kinds of challenges DMU is talking about in that British context about decolonizing the curriculum and decolonizing the institution, we're facing from a slightly different perspective in that our staff draw on the world's academic knowledge to inform their teaching because of where we are in the world but we still have those strange ties to a British institution. And we've been here for 21 uh, years. I should also say that um, Kashika men can, uh, mentioned her sort of first social work module being international uh, perspectives as being a, a, an opener or a moment of change or something that kind of uh, opened up a different world of knowledge and, and felt comfortable. I too have kind of uh, had a pivotal moment and it was at, at DMU uh, where I had a, a sort of a, an educational experience coming into contact with Black Perspectives, my youth and community work uh, degree. Two modules that really opened up my eyes to, some, I guess, to challenging some of the assumptions I had about the value of knowledge, about where knowledge comes from. And I've, I've been reflecting a lot on that over the last year, particularly as we sort of one year's anniversary from George Floyd's death and thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement. And I wrote about some of this recently, about 27 years of kind of struggling with concepts of race and racism and keeping all the time as best as I can, questions of race, questions of racism and questions of my whiteness at the front of my identity. 
So despite my newness, my whiteness, my privilege coming into Malaysia, I'm looking at questions of race, of uh, colonialization, of decolonization from those perspectives. By the way, that sign there, Awas Caution, when I used to arrive at KLIA, our international airport, at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, delirious from travel, uh, uh, travel, I can't even remember. It's been so long since I flew on a plane that what it's called, but it's, it's jet lag, isn't it? When you get jet lag and I'd come off the plane and the very first signs I'd seen as you're coming out of the airport is this big yellow and red sign saying awas, which means caution, warning. And it's the one uh, Malay word I still like to use on a regular basis. So uh, I'm not going to kind of go into the history uh, of uh, Malaysia and its relationship to Britain, because you, you will know this or there are much more authoritative sources uh, to draw upon. But I did kind of want to just uh, dip into some of it. And it's really timely because actually before I was asked to do this seminar, I've been reading this fascinating book by the former attorney general here, Tommy Thomas, who reflects on his, uh, his career in law and in justice over a really interesting uh, set of periods and, and moments uh, in, in the history of um, Malaysia. So, like, Malaya, as it was called, British Malaya, was ruled by the British until independence in 1959. There was a brief interlude with Japanese rule here. And that independence is known as uh, Madurka. And as you can see in the first picture there, we get once a year a really wild celebration. Um, again, I've been here during lockdown, so I've uh, not had the, the pleasure of uh, replicating what this guy is doing there. I think I've got the physique for it. I think I could pull it off, but um, I've not yet had the chance to do that. But that marked the independence. But it's a really interesting period of time that followed because as institutions began to adapt to this new world and as uh, the country began to change and, and try to position itself, it came into all kinds of new conflicts that were the legacy of uh, colonialism. So race riots, for example, challenged that sort of one language, one identity notion, Malay Malaya, which was argued to be one of the contributors to the separation of Malaysia and Singapore in 1965. These were seen as even more important in 1969. Thomas calls it the single most transformative event in terms of the history of this country. It was the end of the sort of three main racist settlement, the Indian, Malay, Chinese, that occurred at the end of colonialization towards this sort of period of emergency, suspension of parliament, a focus on what's called Kentuan Malil, which is Malay supremacy. There's a real focus here on trying to even out um, a long history of economic suppression of different groups. And particularly at this point in that history of Malaysia, recognizing this one group, the Muslim Malay as the Supreme led to all kinds of uh, challenges thereafter. Now, if we compare that to what happened to Singapore, which adopted a sort of CMIO, Chinese, Malay, Indian, and other, a separate but equal sort of approach to designing its society, um, you can see a split between how those two uh, different um, uh, kind of post-colonial states adopted, adapted to their new uh, terrain. But it is important to say it's not as clear color. So in Singapore, a lot of this is about in theory, right? There are a number of problems uh, in terms of how uh, race and class intersect there as well. But what we know is a lot of the issues around race, um, if you look at research uh, from then and look at it now, that actually the racial categorization that led to some of those challenges in 69 onwards and still persist today are inherited from that British define and rule. So um, Reddy and Gleaves did this really fascinating uh, qualitative piece of work where they looked at the, how the cultural legacies of colonialism continue to construct racial identities today. And in their paper, and it's a really kind of telling example, you compare this quote, which is uh, from Wanford Locke writing in 1907, kind of classic uh, colonial piece of work about mining for tin and gold and who you, who you employ from the different races to get your work done. So from a labor point of view, there are practically three races, the Malays, including Javanese, the Chinese and the Tamils, who are generally known as Kling. By nature, the Malay is an idler, the Chinaman a thief, and the Kling is a drunkard, yet each in his own class of work is both cheap and efficient when properly supervised. Now jump ahead to uh, last year, year before, a study that looked at 
the views of Malaysians and Singaporeans across three different countries, Malaysia, Singapore, and in the UK. And some of these kind of stereotypes, views of the other, still are found within the accounts of participants. Indians as alcoholics and laborers, Malays as lazy, Chinese as kiasu, selfish, grasping attitude. What's really um, quite uh, dispiriting and, and makes one pause when you're reading that is how much those um, stereotypes are also internalized. So people who will seek to distance themselves from cultural stereotypes because they've bought into the stereotype and they are deciding through different actions to move away from them. Now, this is always a chance to show off my family, so forgive me. But our everyday experience of plurality is a very, very interesting one. I come from Leicester, like Kashika, um, a multicultural, interesting city, one which I felt uh, always proud with my multicultural family to be able to celebrate things like Diwali with big fireworks. Display. I think, I may not, I, I know these, we should be academically authoritative all the time, but I'm sure I heard once that our celebrations on Melton Road in Leicester are the biggest outside of India. I'm getting a nod from an authoritative source, so I will continue to use that story uh, till the day I die. But hey, you know what? My kids still had to go to school on Diwali. Uh, in terms of uh, Chinese New Year, I, I think we got um, our youngest came home from school in Leicester one day with a homemade lantern but we didn't really understand the uh, Chinese New Year. We didn't really get the significance of some of the lessons around it and so on. Here in Malaysia, it is very different. Our everyday experience is very plural. So we have, uh, at last count, I think, and please those in the UK, don't throw tomatoes at the screen, 17 public holidays. That yes, I can see mouths opening. Uh, across uh, the YouTube audience. Um, 17 public holidays, but we celebrate Christmas. We don't celebrate Boxing Day. We celebrate Christmas, Diwali, Hari Raya. We had two days off for that. Chinese New Year, we had two days. This is a chance for us to really, really feel as a country that we're behind our, um, our different religious, cultural uh, uh, plurality. And it's a chance for our kids as well, who increasingly astonish me, uh, with their grasp of the sort of um, differences across different cultures who sit at a dinner table and teach me Mandarin phrases while we're trying to eat. Please don't test me on any of those uh, this evening. But it does kind of, um, it gives you a sense in the neighbourhood we live in of that sort of thing that we loved about living in Leicester, which is of the cultural plurality, but more of the sort of institutional government or school commitment to making sure that we celebrate uh, different religions, different cultures. But I'm reminded when I was a youth worker of a book which has long since been out of print, but if you can ever find a copy and can lend it to me, I would be really, really grateful because this book is called Beyond Steel Bands and Samosas. And when I was working, uh, I must have been about 20 years old, 1920, trying to understand how to be an anti-racist practitioner. One of the, the lines that comes out from this book is around, you know, it's easy sometimes to celebrate the exotic and easier to do that than engage with the problematic. And I think that the lesson from Beyond Steel Bands and Samosas is, um, whilst it's really, really enriching and important that we're learning about all of these wonderful things and it is doing so much for how you see Malaysia as being unified on race, there are undercurrents of challenge and difficulty that need uh, addressing and they are legacies from colonial rule. Poverty amongst, for example, Bumiputara groups and uh, Malay uh, groups is around about 7.2%, and their sharing corporate sector is around about 16.2% when compared to 30% for non Bumiputara and 45% for foreign holdings. But it's not just Malays. Look at the Indian uh, population here. There's few signs that the severe social ill of poverty, and we're talking about hand to mouth poverty, about people selling bananas on street stalls. Uh, until nine o'clock at night and sleeping under their banana trucks can never be overcome for Indians in the framework of the present political setup in Malaysia. 
We saw in the last general election, 2018, examples of fake news stirred up by political parties designed to foster suspicion towards the Chinese. And that was particularly around sort of consolidating a race first policy. So race, class and policy imperatives continue to intersect in shaping the dynamics here. But decolonization is in the debate here. It's a different kind of debate. It's not the debate about universities necessarily uh, in the UK having to look further afield. But in, in a sense here, it's about looking on our doorstep. It's about recognizing the rich history of what this region has to say about knowledge. And it's, um, you know, there was a question in the last um, James's perceptive question about metrics, but one of the really interesting stories about Malaysia's education system at the moment is how it continues to climb up international league tables as it um, gets stronger and stronger in its research output. I think the University of Malaya is now in the top 50 universities in the world. And it does so on drawing on uh, that sort of rich uh, Asian uh, uh, academic knowledge. So decolonization is not only about the lowering of flag histories, it's about getting into that, as Kashika talked about, disentanglement, re-entanglement and re-enlightenment. Intellectual production from universities in Malaysia must factor in the reintegration of the political, economic, social and cultural dimensions of knowing, a restructuring of knowledge about ourselves. So there was in as far back as 2011, which I cannot believe is 10 years ago now, is there was the international conference in decolonizing our universities held here, which led to a joint statement. You can find this on uh, the USM website where every trace of Eurocentrism in our universities, um, you know, through theories, models, needs to be subordinated to our own scintillating cultural and intellectual traditions. The core structures, syllabi, books, reading materials, all of this needs to reflect the treasury of our thoughts, the riches of our indigenous traditions and the felt necessities of our societies. Now, I've been constrained a lot by being confined often to the house. I did have these very few uh, positive weeks where COVID-19 numbers come down and I suddenly get full of optimism that I'll be on traveling the country far and wide. Um, that usually results actually in being able to drive to the campus for about two weeks until we were back in the house. So uh, one of the things as a trained youth and community worker, as an academic who believes in the, you know, getting out and about and being out in the communities that we're part of, is I want to walk the patch and I want to do more of that. But even since being here, I've had the privilege of learning and getting involved in a few interesting initiatives that are going on. So in the same way that DMU has talked about what it's been doing, and I was really um, interested and I've put in my references at the end in the blog post marking the one year of progress on the sort of gold uh, movement towards an anti-racist university. Um, I'm working with a local international school, particularly a teacher in a local international school who's in the midst of kind of reframing his role and the role of his peers in an anti-racist committee uh, as it addresses the comments from black and Asian students about how to be more effective in challenging racism. So in the same way that many universities in the UK experienced, um, like I did, letters from students saying, what are you going to do uh, now that the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement is gaining momentum? Where do you stand? What's your position? What action do you need to take? That's happening here too. It's happening from those students who have felt excluded, who felt they are lacking representation and so on. One of the major think tanks here, Ideas, has been hosting and convening a really interesting series of events, papers and public debates on the future of race and identity in Malaysia. And I would encourage anybody with an interest in this topic who wants to look at perspectives from a different country to engage in some of those debates. Um, there's been challenges to those debates as well for excluding certain voices um, from it. So it'd be interesting to see how uh, that goes forward. There are conversations going on with um, I've certainly colleagues at University of Malaya have been leading on some of this around um, debating the strengthening of citizenship and human rights education in schools as one mechanism for building collective identity. And certainly from a university perspective, much more uh, focus on proactively engaging international uh, ties across the ASEAN region so that we can challenge the Western centric dominance in social science in particular. Oh, so my concluding uh, 
uh, slide is that I'm presented today a kind of, uh, you know, sort of walk through an outsider's view, but a view nonetheless. Colonization is warm, woven into the fabric of all former colonies. It's most pronounced, in my view, in identity formation. You see it even generations later in how people relate, how they see their position, and how that helps them or hinders them in shaping knowledge. The decolonization project here, if there is one, is focused on three threads. The first is understanding and shaking off the legacies of colonial racial categorization and how we describe ourselves in relation to others. It's about challenging the dominance of Western-centric knowledge, but it's also wrestling with different que difficult questions around poverty, inequality, and racial dominance. And um, of course, I present a reference list to an audience that is looking online, can't click the links, can't do anything like that, but hopefully you can pause or you can go back later because everything on this list is highly recommended. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, fascinating stuff. And I, th I particularly enjoy this idea that decolonization is about rejecting dominance. It's not about dismissing traditions because all traditions and knowledges can be mutually, mutually enriching. And that goes, I think, for the Western traditions as well. Of course, Western culture is fertile and exciting and productive. The problem arises when it tries to impose those visions on, on, on everything and, and marginalizes and dismisses other rich traditions. Uh, we learn much more when we learn from one another. And if I can just go off message for a bit to just say that um, I've done a lot of work in other countries on, on what's sometimes referred to as policy transfer. And a mistake that I always tried to avoid was going into a country and saying, well, this is how you do things. Uh, and if you approach it in a spiritual of mutual learning and recognizing how much you have to learn from those other countries, it makes an altogether more fruitful experience. Um, the floor is open again. I just want to thank and acknowledge Woon Chin Yong, who's a Malaysian gen uh, gentleman, uh, sorry, a Malaysian uh, who has been confirming the, about the number of public holidays that you have. Um, I met an Albanian who said that the secret of success of interculturalism in his country was that everybody celebrated every possible uh, occasion by every tradition and culture. So they were partying all the year round. Um, which might explain why it's rather hard up as well as quite <laughs> traditionally quite peaceful. Um, open to the panel, uh, please react and look forward to some more questions coming in on the YouTube stream as well. Kashika. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Jason. Uh, really great insight into your first year in living in Malaysia, I would say that I know you've been in and out of Malaysia for, for a long, long time with your work, but um, a really good insight into kind of your positionality around it. Um, and that was really helpful. What I found really interesting is towards that your end slide when you talked about the, if there is a, a project of decolonization and the three points that you made. So I it's, it's a question, I think, but it, I, I don't know. I don't know how to put it as a question. So I'm just going to keep talking. <laughs> And then you'll take something out of it, I hope. So what, one of the things that uh, tests universities, I know it's testing universities and it's testing my universities, is the, is the thing of transnational education and partnering with international universities. And the, the debate as part of the decolonizing project at De Montfort is about the transfer of some of our policies and procedures with into the universities that we are partnering with along on the programs that we we, we we will be sharing or underwriting or however you want to you want to describe it and you talked about um, the western centric knowledge or challenging the western centric knowledge in the Malay University doing looking at that and doing that how does that work with so you it's Nottingham University in Malaysia how does that work in terms of the tra knowledge transfer sort of thing that Rob just talked about but educationally and the context of the institution or the context of the country that that institution is in so we're having lots of those debates about what are we teaching and how are we contextualizing that teaching in another country but it's the program that we deliver in the UK how how do you work with that 
think it's a really good question. And I think um, you're, you're right in saying, I mean, it's, it's an interesting pers- um, position where my institution is. So it's University of Nottingham. It's in Nottingham in the UK. It's in Malaysia and it's in China. Uh, now, what you'll see is certain things that will cross all three of those campuses and be fairly unified. But um, what we what we see less of is that here's the UK product. Now go deliver abroad, right? So now take our product, go deliver it in Malaysia. I think probably branch campuses, and I, don't, I haven't worked in them long enough to know, but I, my sense of them is that in the early days, sort of flying out the faculty to deliver content abroad was probably the dominant model. But if you take something within my faculty as an example, media and culture. Um, So here we have uh, maybe in the UK a films, uh, a module around films, uh, uh, where you might be studying, uh, probably uh, as is often the case in film and culture, you'll be studying uh, material from around the world. When you come to Malaysia and you study film, you'll be looking at Indonesian cinema. You'll be looking at the history of Malaysian cinema. You'll be looking at things that are very sort of built within the fabric of the country where people are, despite it being an institution that has that British roots. But but I think you raised something about what is always going to be a challenge that we have to work on, which is how, how do you kind of make sure that we avoid any sense that Nottingham UK is a mothership and that its its branch campuses are somehow satellites. Now, again, maybe 20 years ago, that model was certainly true. I think now increasingly, and a lot of this is coming out of Nottingham itself, largely affected, I think, by the debates around decolonization, around uh, where, where do we get our knowledge from, that actually we should be driven as much by what the Malaysia campus has to say about the state of the world uh, and China campus has to say about the state of the world and how that influences Nottingham's growth and development. So creating that sort of dialogue to be on a much more equal footing. Now, in reality, yes, that's happening. Let's not forget that the mothership (laughs) that we just described is very, very big, very large. You know, I alone have, I have my uh, with two faculties, I'm the dean of one of them, and I have three faculties I relate to back at home uh, in the UK at home. So there's there's all kind of tension in terms of size, scale, reach, history um, that that will take a long time to overcome. But the principle has been set, which we are, you know, a, a university in three countries, three campuses, one university, and we we need to be able to draw on those uh, other sites uh, to inform our development. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Jokey. Uh, Sorry, Jokey. Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Thank you. I'm just um, taking from, uh, you know, what um, Jason is answering now, just uh, that's um, Kashika's question again about challenging Western-centric knowledge. Uh, I'm one of those, um, you know, people that so much challenge uh, that uh, Western-centric knowledge. And I've also um, shown that in, one of the papers I, I published recently, Malozi 2021, um, on Western criminology vis-a-vis Nigerian criminology. Um, see, when talking about this decolonization, uh, that brings to bear because um, we from the global south always try to use Western or rather the Anglo-American theoretical perspectives, you know, to explain crime and criminal behavior. And when we do that, we don't seem to get it right. There are things that are still lacking, you know, in, in the whole thing because Western criminology, Western criminologists are imported into our own culture. I liked what, you know, Rob said that um, decolonization is, is about rejecting dominance. They dominate and they, Principally, American criminology dominates so much the vast of the world. When you are studying criminology, if you don't put in what American scholars have said, you have not started. It has also come to Britain as well. American and the British, these are the only two areas that you must have to bring in. So when I was 
In fact, the whole thing started when I was doing my PhD, you know, interviews. And, um, you know, I was interviewing people in Nigeria and trying to match up with theoretical perspectives. That was extremely difficult to explain subcultures in Nigeria. And then I ended up criticizing these subcultures. That's how I came into the study of subcultures. That's how I came into the, the, the criticism of Western you know, theoretical perspectives because they will only give you the periphery. It, it's like this. They will not go, they will not go into the, the, the deeper culture of the people to know why they do what they do. They do not consider, you know, the nature of policing in the country. They do not consider the nature of gathering criminal statistics within the country. They do not consider developmental studies within the country. They try to lift them up that way from the West. So, okay, if it is, for example, poverty, people are people getting into robbery because maybe they are poor, and then people will like, okay, let's use strength theory. But when Merton was doing that, Merton was thinking about the American dream and American society. Mm-hmm. So we need to a kind of contextualize and culturize things. And then we can then come into the open to say we share it with others. I, I would rather prefer the idea of diversity so much, you know, to decolonization. I would prefer diversity because everybody bring what you have, let us share it together. Because if we go deeper into decolonization, I b- believe you me, the structures that made it will be the bottlenecks that will hamper the, the progress of this movement because it is a movement. The movement has a time limit. I, I'm just nodding away. Um, and for people who are listening to the audio version, they wouldn't have picked up my nods. But, but I, I kind of, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, here's, here's an, another layer to it, right? So criminology we're talking about right now, there is almost no such thing as, as the name of criminology here in Malaysia. Right. There's 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 uh, law, there's social sciences, but that branch, that whole sort of thing that we the industry of criminology that we know uh, that emanates from the US, from the UK. And speaking as someone who's been, you know, intimately connected to that um, is, is not here. But there are different places where that knowledge exists. There are different ways in which that knowledge comes to the fore. And there are different debates that are to be had. And I think one of the, the most frustrating things I found just before I left the UK was that 95 out of 100 people were, would either give a mix of good-natured envy, uh, the, the warm weather and good food I was looking forward to, uh, or, you know, good well wishes, all of that. But there were 5% of people who had a whole kind of set of assumptions about where, where we were going and what that part of the world was. And from that, that outlook, you know, that sense that have you thought about human rights? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And part of your, your really eloquent um, response there, it, it captures that sense that actually we see the world through that prism, don't we? We, we make all kinds of judgments, make all um, from a discipline or from our own worldview that shapes our of you. Whereas actually, when you get on the ground here and you talk to people, you see there's a whole different currency of knowledge, a whole different set of perspectives. Now, I guess my challenge to the social scientists of Malaysia is to get those stories out, get those theories developed, do much more work. And we know there are criminologists uh, from Malaysia who've contributed significant work around, for example, white collar crime that's challenged uh, dominant Western perspectives. But much more of that uh, is to come, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, I think it's uh, Dave Ward. Um, you have your hand up, I think. Do you, Dave? Please, yes, that, please, please join in. That's correct. That's correct. Um, I've um, I've got a. Um, a question really which relates to both Kaushika's presentation 
well, a question stroke comment, which relates to both Kaushika's presentation and to, uh, and to Jason's. Um, and, and all along, I've been trying to relate what I've been hearing specifically to criminal justice. Um, although we've been talking very much from an educational and an educational institution perspective. But I was struck very much when Kashika said that when they were doing their exploration surveys um, at, um, at De Montfort, that it wasn't the curriculum as such which came up as the top of the agenda for deconstruction and decolonization, but it was the things that went around that. And so I was kind of saving up a question for later on in the, um, in the seminar, which was, well, is the, problem, is the problem then not the law, but the way the law that is applied is applied if we're thinking about um, decolonization in a criminal justice concept. But then, as we've been, as, as we've been going on, particularly as, Je as Jason's been talking, I thought, well, clearly the law is very cultural, cultural centric. Um, and the law which is um, being the law which has been um, which exists in so much of the war world is grounded on the laws that were brought by the colonists. And then I thought, hey, as Jason found a way of unlocking this, in that he, he suggests that we really have to start at a ground level. And I think he said, human rights education, if we're going to um, move forward um, to create a decolonized, a diverse, um, a diverse society. Um, and I just wondered if any of um, any of the uh, of the of the speakers and panelists had themselves any thoughts about the degree to which the law is a problem, or is it the application and all of the things that go around it, which is which is the greater problem. I'm Again, I'm nodding away. I don't know if Kashika wants to kind of jump in as well. Wow. But um, I, I think the, the ground up stuff is really uh, important, Dave, because I think, you know, the institutions, the laws, the context, the culture, the, the unraveling of that over many, many generations, uh, as we know throughout the history of everything is that that takes a very long time and we see it in the, the accounts of participants who are interviewed over time as well but I think what we also see and you might recall Dave 20 years ago I was doing stuff on young people's citizenship then that actually um, there are very interesting alternative accounts of young people coming up that if we listen to, acted upon, engaged with in a much more constructive way, not necessarily just teaching about how to be citizen, how to be, you know, engage with human rights. If we create the capacities for critical questioning and we get people much more, uh, the institutions embedded within the communities that they're situated in, you can begin to get that collective voice. And there's all kinds of practical examples of that um, uh, that you can draw on. I was also just thinking about one of um, this links, I think, Kashika's point before about the sort of um, transnational aspect of this, that I think a lot of work around these, sort of, well, these sorts of projects or debates or issues has tended to see policy transfer as a one way or an adaptation thing. So, and I'm, I, I'm guilty of this to, to a large extent. In, the, in a previous job, I do lots of work around training police or probation, and then I jump on a plane and talk to other people who are doing police and training, uh, police and probation training, and share knowledge and, you know, engage in that. Uh, whereas more exciting work 
actually. Uh, if I point to a colleague um, in public health who's developed a really interesting and exciting partnership with uh, Uganda, and their method of knowledge exchange is genuinely two-way. So how do we improve the health outcomes of residents living in Nottingham by drawing on the lessons of community health workers in villages in Uganda? And in turn, how might Nottingham be able to contribute something to the monitoring and evaluation of that work in Uganda? So genuinely seeing actually that people are coming to the table for an exchange of ideas and a dialogue. Thank you, Jason. I'd like to give the floor to Brian in just a moment because I think it's uh, we can carry on these conversations, I suspect, after Brian's contribution has enrich, enriched our debate. Um, I just want to make two quick reflections. Uh, I use the expression policy transfer, and I think the expression policy exchange is a, an altogether better way of understanding it for the reasons that you just described, Jason, that it has to be a, a mutual respect and the a recognition of the opportunities of learning uh, one from another rather than I know this and I'm going to transfer it to you. Um, the other reflection I've got is that uh, um, the, the question of human rights, <clears throat> and we may not have time to explore this fully today, <clears throat> but there are those who have said that the whole human rights discourse is itself profoundly colonised. Um, and although it's something to which the United Nations have subscribed, maybe the United Nations as an institution reflects the dominance of, of thinking of which we're not all fully aware. It's just simply so taken for granted. You know, when Chijoki said that uh, there were generalisations made by American criminologists, very often they're not even aware that they are general, whether that they are suppressing other traditions. To them, it's just self-evident. It's common sense. It's so embedded in the way in which they think. Anyway, I'm abusing my position as facilitator, as but I, you're so it's your fault. You're all so interesting that I uh, need to reflect. So I'm going to be quiet now, and I'm going to invite Brian uh, to talk to us from Australia. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. And I hope you can all see a big W on um, the screen. Can I have a oh, I get a nod from Kashika? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm um, speaking to you from um, from Sydney in Australia, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the country where I'm speaking to you um, with respect for Aboriginal cultural protocol and out of recognition that its campuses occupy the traditional lands. Western Sydney University acknowledges Darug, Eora, Darawal, also referred to as Tarawal and Wiradjuri peoples, and thanks them for their support of its work in their lands in Greater Western Sydney and beyond. Um, as I'm speaking to an international audience, I feel I need to say a little bit about the, the acknowledgement of country. Um, the acknowledgement of country is, is something, this, this acknowledgement of country that I've just given is a um, uh, is, is agreed by our university. It speaks to our multi-campus university and acknowledges the different groups of people. And it's one um, that, that we're traditional owners of the, of the land. Um, we are, I'm also, I'm speaking from home now and, and, and my home in the inner west in Sydney um, belong to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And, and one of the things that we will say about this acknowledgement of country is that these traditional owners never ceded their land. And um, it's, it's an important point of context and history in terms of where we are in, in, um, in, in Australia and where we were and, and the land of which we're speaking to. So I've said a bit about place. I'll also say something about time. Um, it's very appropriate to be speaking about some of these issues this week because this week is Reconciliation Week in um, Australia. And Reconciliation Week is the same week every year and is bookmarked by two events or bookmarked almost by three events. And um, so the um, the start of Reconciliation Week is the anniversary of the referendum in 1967. And the referendum was the first time that Indigenous Indigenous people in Australia were recognised as being as being Australian citizens and are and and being part of, of the Australian populace. At the end of um, the of Reconciliation Week, which is today, today is the last week and in, in last day of Reconciliation Week, it is the anniversary of what's known as the Mabo decision. And the Mabo decision was the recognition of land rights. It was the, a, legal, a legal dismissal of the idea of terra nullius and the colonising idea that, that 
Captain Cook landed on an empty land, and that's what terra nullius means, um, and, 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 and built a country from there. And that was dismissed by the courts and, and, and the recognition of the ownership of the land at that time. And the day before, um, the, 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 the day before Reconciliation Week is known as National Sorry Day. And in 1997, um, the then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, um, and, it, and it, is, it is a speech worth, worth watching if you haven't seen it, um, apologised to the Indigenous people of Australia for the, pro, the, the stolen generation for the practice of removing children um, from their homes. And again, that practice of removing children from their homes was facilitated by the lack of legal recognition. And I, and I, I, I don't want to talk about those three events in, in, in a lot of, or those three really significant anniversaries in a, a lot of depth. But I would ask you to reflect on the years that I quoted from of 1967, 1992 and 1997. And when we talk about colonization in Australia, we're not talking about something that's in the past. We're talking about something that's part of our present. So um, I'm Brian Stout. I, I haven't actually said a lot about um, introducing myself after Kashika's comment. I decided to put all my titles on my slide because titles are meaning. I think the meaning of my titles are that every time the vice chancellor looks at me, he thinks this is the guy who doesn't seem very busy and gives me something extra uh, to, to do. But I will say a little bit about very briefly about my background. Um, I am from Northern Ireland um, originally. I, I, I trained I, I, I trained at university in England in Northern Ireland, worked as a social worker and as a probation officer um, in Northern Ireland um, for, for a number of years. I then spent three years in South Africa. Um, I, I consider those three years in South Africa as, as, a, as a VSO in, in South Africa, working at a university there. That's where I started my PhD. That's where I, I, I started my relationship with De Montfort University, which brought me into, and I met Dave when I was there, and it brought me into contact with many of, of, of you. Uh, then spent some time in, in at at De Montford in, in, in Leicester and then and, and my, my children are both born in Leicester Royal Infirmary and um, and I um and I then moved to, to Australia in, in, in 2012. And one of the things I would want to say on, on this, I did a presentation from my university yesterday for Reconciliation Week, is that that word reconciliation has been a really important part of, of, of my life. Um, that the reconciliation of um the um of, of Northern Ireland and, 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 and the conversation that I had growing up and working as a social worker and um, reconciliation in, in Australia, particularly in South Africa and that association between truth and reconciliation. And I think both Jason and Kashika have also talked a bit about Leicester and the, what an incredible place Leicester is. Not, not, a, not a perfect place, but in many ways, a, a, a model for a society in which we would, we, we would wish to, to create. And particularly, I think that Kashika's presentation spoke to that, spoke about the, 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 the leadership role that she and, and her institution are, are, are playing in, in that decolonization work. So I'm, 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 I'm very proud of all those places that I've lived. Um, I want to say a, a bit about, I'm conscious of, of not wanting to spend too much time on my presentation and I will reveal that I think the most interesting bits in my presentation are the first few slides and the last few slides. So I might skip through the middle very, very quickly, but I do feel I want to say some very important contextual pieces as well to talk. And, my, and, my, and I, was, I was really interested to hear the conversation about society more broadly and universities from, from Kashika and from Jason. I'm going to focus very much on criminal justice. Australia, the current representation within criminal justice in, in, in Australia. And, and I'm always wary of giving too many statistics because sometimes they, they, they stories tell, tell reflect things more than numbers, but the numbers need to be shared in, in, in Australia. 3% of Australia are Indigenous. Um, the, 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 I, I became an Australian citizen um, two years ago and there, and there was a presentation, Tony Burke, a former Labour minister, gave the talk, at, he's a local MP, gave the talk and he said, um, it was a very powerful moment being um, um, going through citizenship and he said, every Australian every Australian story either begins with, with a moment of immigration or starts tens of thousands of years ago. And the Indigenous Australians are the ones whose stories started tens of thousands of years ago. 3% of the population are Indigenous. 59% of young people in juvenile detention are Indigenous. An even more stark statistic that, that is sometimes true and sometimes not true, there are states in Australia where 100% of the, the of the young people in, in juvenile Northern Territory being one of them um, are are in, in indigenous. Indigenous children are 26 times more likely to be in detention than non-indigenous children. 
the age of criminal responsibility in Australia is 10. Now, there are a couple of states have been there have been frustrated attempts to try and change this. And there are a couple of states, I think ACT most recently, they've gone their own way and raised that. But across Australia, including in New South Wales, where I am now, it, it, it's um, it's 10. The Indigenous rate of incarceration is 2,253 per 100,000 people with 146 per 100,000 people for the non-Indigenous population. The um, Indigenous Australians are the most incarcerated people in the world. There, there's a number of things we could say about this, but a, a, and I've, I've talked about a few moments ago about significant um, the significant anniversaries. One of the, the, the significant moments in, in, in history um, about the, um, in, in terms of the treatment of Indigenous Australians is the Royal Commission into Aboriginal um, Deaths in Custody. The 30th anniversary was this, this year. Um, over 470 Indigenous people had died in custody since that report, since the government sent a, a, a royal commission there. The, 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 um, the rec- some of the, rec- many of the recommendations were accepted, but the main, the report was very clear. The main reason for high death rate is high incarceration rate. That is the number one reason that actually, if you look at the, the, the death rate of Indigenous prisoners compared to non-Indigenous prisoners, it's not that different. The difference is the incarceration rate. The difference is the number of people um, who are there. It is different, but not the same. The rate of incarceration has doubled in those 30 years from 14% to 29%. And the least implemented, so when the review was carried out this year and, and said whether the recommendation were implemented, not implemented, or partly implemented, the worst scores were those that related to alternatives to incarceration. So this is a terrible problem, and it's a terrible problem. It's a terrible problem that's getting worse, and it's a terrible problem where the solutions have been identified. And again, for those of you, and I know many of you are scholars of of, of UK, criminal justice, I think we can all identify moments, reports and recommendations in UK criminal justice where the answers were there, the answers were clear, but were, were never followed. This is a good example of that. I want to say a bit about criminology in, 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 um, in Australia. And these are the slides I really want to, to, to flick through because some of these, because one of the things I think I'm in, that's interesting for me in coming here is the response of criminology, criminal justice, the academy to what's going on. And I think some of what we see in um, Australia is recognisable. So there's a very strong, in, in response to, to what's going on, there's very strong administrative criminology. And I would say some of the administrative criminal, or a lot of the administrative criminology is very good. So there is a government investment in crime research and gathering of data. And um, some of that is federal, a lot of it is, is at state level. So Boxar in New South Wales it will produce reports on, will produce prison data, will produce, and some of the data, some of the, what I quoted from before, when you, you quote varying um, incarceration rates, that, that relies on, on the data. It, it's publicly accessible, often re- um, receives widespread um, media attention. So administrative criminologists will sometimes get some, some criticism and, and, and sometimes it's seen as a theoretical or a critical, but it is a good way to get in the media and they do produce a, and, and they do produce a lot of data that, that others rely on. Um, critical criminology in Australia, I think some people would say critical criminology is just criminology. I'm pretty sympathetic to that, that, that position. That's what, really what criminology is. If you walked into our library at Western Sydney University, if you picked up one of the reading lists uh, from we, we have a large number of criminology students, picked a few key texts, what went into followed the code and went to the right corridor in the library, picked up three or four books at random, you're going to recognize them. They, they are, it's a UK tradition, it's a US tradition. It's not solely that way. Um, you will not see many Malaysian scholars um, written there. Um, and I know you're saying there's not much criminology in Malaysia. I think that's probably true in other disciplines as well. I think would very clearly sit within uh, um, Anglo tradition criminology within Australia. Strong student numbers, high number of courses throughout the country, qualitative and qualitative strands. And I'm not being critical of, of, of critical criminology. A lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of excellent work and a lot of it focused this is very clearly on the work that, that, that on, on the, the issues that, 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 that I've talked about, about overrepresentation, about police behavior, about, about um, prisons. And I would say, I'm not going to talk an awful lot about Black Lives Matter. I think Black Lives Matter had a big, big impact in Australia. But speaking in very, very broad terms, some of the concerns about the police, some of the concerns are very much focused on the police in America, I think very much focuses on, on, on prisons um, in Australia, not not. You know, and, and not to, to take the police out of that. There is an, an increasing interest in Southern criminology, and you, some of you will have seen there's books, edited collections of British Journal of Criminology deals with Southern criminology, and this has proven to be quite a 
an interesting idea and quite a controversial idea. And, and I, I think speaks to some of what we've talked about before, about um, diff- looking at different scholars, looking at different focuses, looking at different locuses of, of, of interest um, of criminology, and the aim of, um, of bringing the periphery into the centre, questioning the Western Northern emphasis in criminology. But it does raise the question um, that sounds like a facetious question, is where is Australia? Is Australia in the South? Or is Australia a northern country that happens to be on the, the on, on underneath the, the the line that we call the the equator? And by bringing Australian, and I think you could possibly say large aspects of South African criminology, the not all of South African criminology, into into a southern criminology raises as many questions as, as, as it answers, because are you just looking at some of the same traditions, ideas, assumptions that, that are um, that are coming there? So it's a fairly new set of ideas of, of, uh, and perspectives. It opens some interesting debates. It's not clear, and there's a, a degree of skepticism um, about whether we'll meet what's needed and, and, and meet the demands of what we talked about in the earlier contextual piece. I'm now back to the bits that I think are more interesting. Um, decolonization. So decolonization, and, and, and as you'll see, I, I have very inclusively used both spellings on, on, on this slide. It's not a straightforward term or process in Australia. And some of the reason for that is to do with what I talked about before, about the over-representation. And I'm not talking about the over-representation of black people or non-white people. I'm talking about an over-representation of indigenous people. And that's one of the, the, the one of the limitations of a decolonizing debate or decolonizing discourse or a multicultural discourse or a diversity discourse. It's not about different groups. There are there are issues, and certainly we could have a conversation about um, Australia's tra- um, appalling treatment of asylum seekers and how that fits into some of the, the, the assumptions and some of the ideas of Australia. But there is a conversation to be had about indigenous people that has to be about indigenous Australians. So speaking about putting this debate within a broader decolonization agenda, and I think there are ways that that's helpful, and certainly my understanding, uh, and and certainly I I hear what Kashika says, and and think that I'd I'd love some of the leaders in our university to hear uh, hear, hear that, because some some of the people who are working on some of those very similar ideas, I think could could learn from that, but it's not the same. And the, uh, many people prefer to use the language of indigenous people uh, of indigenization because it centers indigenous people and centers a positive process. It's not a D or or a, or or a, or a, a removal. It's, it's it's an addition and it's recognizing the primacy both in terms of importance and of time. The other language which which I have to say none of you have used tonight, but the other language that's seen as particularly problematic is the language of post-colonization because it immediately carries the, the response of, well, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware that it had finished. Now, when I read about post-colonization, it's often defined as being after the start of colonization, not after the end of colonization. But I think we have to accept that it's not always heard in that way and it's not always the right language to be, to be used. So it's, it's, it's more about the, so a decolonization process. And again, I'm not being totally critical of it. It draws attention to the overrepresentation of indigenous people, but it also promotes processes such as Curry courts, restorative justice, justice reinvestment. Again, very positive processes, but not unproblematic and certainly not immune to policy crap capture or, or, or dilution or being or being changed that way. So um what is often preferred as as or so or, or starting to be no it be preferred by some indigenous indigenous voices and, and 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 when I say indigenous voices and indigenous criminologists there is uh we we have um there's there's a an in, indigenous woman who works in, in the criminology department in, in, in our school who I think is arguably the only indigenous criminologist um, with, within Australia. There, there are people who work in Australia, who work in criminology in Australia, perhaps based in, who are indigenous, who are based in law departments or psychology departments or based elsewhere. Whether she's the only one or not, there's not very many. Um, and sometimes when you look at languages of, of, of abolition, and, and there's certainly not many indigenous academics who are being published in the main journals. So sometimes you have to look to podcasts, to blogs, to social media, to see some of these ideas coming forward. I would want to be really clear about this. Abolitionism is not a metaphor. It's not an analogy. It is an absolutely clear idea of of 
abolition of the, the criminal justice system. That the idea that the criminal justice system is a product of colonialism, it is something that has only brought bad things for indigenous people and, um, and, and should be abolished. And one of the ways that that has been manifested at, at the moment has been there has been, a, there's a lot of concern given about domestic violence and about violence against women. Um, and that's led by some political scandals in, in Australia. And some of that, as, as you will see, as you'll be familiar with from the UK, some of that leads to campaigns for tougher sanctions and, and tougher sentencing and more police powers. And the, the, those abolitionists are coming back on those issues, which often are, are some of the people who would support decolonization often will also support greater police powers when it comes to domestic violence, will say, no, all you're doing, there is no reason, no reason at all to be given more part of the police, because all that does is lead to more indigenous people being locked up. And, and there's evidence to support that argument, you know, whether that whether you, you, you agree with it or not. So abolition of, of incarceration, abolition of the police, abolition of the criminal justice system, and abolition of criminology. And that you see that being called for as well, that criminologists are people who are who are living off. And I know that when I was a social worker, certainly in probation, we used to talk a lot about our job was to make ourselves redundant and, and make ourselves unemployed. It never happened. Um, and I think there's an argument for that for criminologists as well, that unless you're trying to do yourself out of a job, unless you're campaigning to get rid of the system that, that, is, that is having this impact on Indigenous people, then you're not doing your job properly. My final slide, as I'm aware, I'm over time. One of the things that, that, that strikes me is what can we do? Jason outed himself as a white man, and, and I think I have to reveal that I also meet that category as well. And, and, and I think that that's something that, that it's a challenging position to be in, to say, well, what, what, what are we going to do? What, what, what should I do in, 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 this, in this position as, as, you know, as, as an Austra uh, working in criminal justice um, research in, in Australia now as a, as a, as a manager um, within a, a university? And these are some of the things that, that um, that, that I come back to. Um, first, you question the assumptions of, of, of um, the, the criminal justice system. In, in your writing, in your work as, as researchers, don't assume that this is the way it has to be. And, and if I can name drop and give an example of that, a perfect example of that would be Rob's work on punishment. So rather than looking at, at, at saying, you know, a response to to things that we want to stop is is to is to punish to greater sanctions, greater police power, more incarceration. Question those assumptions. Think about it a different way. Make arguments and contribute to rolling back criminal justice. So um, some of that would be that justice reinvestment rolls back criminal justice, restorative justice. I think particularly the, the thing that I perhaps feel most passionate about the raising of the age of the criminal just um, age of criminal responsibility. Every time you ra you raise that, you take a whole cohort of people outside the criminal justice system and change the discourse of what do you do? What do you do about a 12-year-old who's got behaviour that, 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 that is causing problems for himself, his family and, and his community? If the answer is not lock it up, lock him up, it forces you to come up with some creative uh, solutions. But those arguments that roll back the criminal justice system have to um, contribute to rolling back the state. And so it can't just be, and this is one of the criticisms of justice reinvestment, sometimes it's about taking money from one part of the state and giving it to another part of the state, giving it to, 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 to um, another agency to, to, to manage it. If you're going to roll back the criminal justice system, you roll back the state and you empower communities. And, and, and those, are, those are the contributions that really want to make. And finally, and I think this speaks to me and this brings it back to the university, to support Indigenous scholars, to, to, to make sure you're making appointments, make sure in promotion, make sure in, in co-authorships, in citations, in, I think for us as well, um, it's particularly about um, scholarships. It's, it's about um, masters of, of research scholarships, PhD scholarships, and making sure that we're bringing in a generation through of, of an, an indigenous scholars who are being able to have that voice and have that influence um, on the academy and then on society more broadly. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Fabulous stuff. Really exciting and challenging. I mean, a, th a thought that's coming straight into my head before I open it up for for <clears throat> uh, a wider conversation is this, the challenge that Stan Cohen put years ago. Can the state be expected to roll itself back? Um, you know, if, if we said that the state should be rolled back, how is that going, in fact, going to be to be accomplished? Um, that's just a quick reflection. Uh, panel members, uh, what thoughts has Brian prompted in your minds? I, I certainly he's shown us very vividly how we can move into something much, much wider 
than uh, university curricula or, 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 or anything. Chijoki, I think I saw your hand up. Yes, um, from what um, Brian has said, thank you very much, Brian. Yes, you, you are using the word indigenization, you know, and the post-colonialization, also decolonization. You talked about the criminal justice system as a product of colonialization, uh, colonialism. Uh, I agree with you. Um, I remember that in Africa, before we were colonized, we had our own practices that are alternatives to imprisonment, that are... Uh, that have been working for the people before, you know, the white man came. Um, but then, of course, with the coming of the of the of the expatriates, those things were pushed to the background. Now, how can we um, decolonize the CJS, especially here in the West, uh, to include, you know? Other diversities, and apart from employment, which you know we talk about, employ the minorities to give them a say in the criminal justice system. Will that be enough? My my direct question is: Can we decolonize legislation to accommodate people from other cultures who have made here their home? That's my question. Um. <laughs> Nobody can answer. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose I, I, I'll put that back. I mean, there, there, there's a, the Cambie element. There's always that. But the, I think with any debates that go with abolition um, and and um, decarcerate, decarceration, um, they there, there's always that bit of what we're moving towards and then what we can practically do at the moment. And, and I think that whenever we we, we talk about this, and, and, and as I said, it's, it's not a metaphor, it's not presented as being um, a, a distant dream. And, and I, would, I, I would use the analogy of what we can achieve. I would go back to Northern Ireland. If, if I look at um, where I was, in, where Northern Ireland was in the, in the 80s and 1990s, and talk about, and people talk about where the criminal justice system would be, and particularly where the police force would be from 1980 to, to, to 2021, um, it, 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 it feels like something that wouldn't be achievable if you spoke to somebody from, from 1985, but it's still recognizably a, a, a police force. And I, and I think there are things that can be done. I think some of it is is about political will. And I think, you know, to pick up on Rob's question or Stan Cohen's question that you, that you refer to, I think I would I think I would say that the advocates and the campaigners in Australia have such low expectations of policymakers and of the state that they would say, well, well, no, we can't really expect that. We have we have to we have to take the things that that that, that aren't going to be um given to us. I think if you're talking about from a UK point of view, I think there is still the, you know, that 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 the legacy of colonization sits within the UK. There has to be a recognition of the number of, of societies, the number of backgrounds, the number of traditions that, that, that sit within that, but also the, the history that, that's led to the country that it is now. So I think I think it can be done in a theoretical way. I don't have any great optimism of that happening anytime soon. Shika, I see you've uh, you want to come in. Yeah, I mean it's, it's moving away from Chijoka's question, but but it, it is a, a I agree with Brian's response to Chijoka's question that theoretically, yes, practically, the will, the history, create significant challenges. I had three points that I just wanted to make. They're not necessarily questions, Brian. Um, thanks for your presentation. Your statistics were were fascinating. It it you know the three percent indigenous population and then the percentage of those that are incarcerated. Um, I have to say that the acknowledgement of country right at the beginning was particularly powerful. Um, never seen anything like that before in any of the international presentations. And it, it got me thinking about um, acknowledging and apologising are, are very, and the, the restorative element of that are very important. But also, um, I mean, I don't know how this came about in Australia, but the positioning of the Indigenous peoples within having that as an opener for certain things like this, I think is be really interesting, but it was great. Um, I love the question about where is Australia? Um, is it, is it Southern or is it Northern Enclave? Um, and I was looking at the map that you put up and, and do you know what the thing that came into my mind is, is, is what we call when I talk about the global South is the global South being colonized by Australia being in the South. 
So I don't know if that's the right terminology, but it was a really interesting question. I hadn't thought about it like that. And I like the, you know, the conversation about indigenization, indigenization versus decolonization. We've had that conversation quite a lot with the team that I'm working with. Um, and a couple of the scholars that I'm working with, we had the debate about, um, you know, what, what do we mean by decolonization? Where's, where, you know, indigenization is, is um, an, an area of research within our team where people were talking about um, the perception and the, and the positioning of decolonization and where it came from and where its origins are. And you talk about land and you talked about, you know, people didn't cede their land, but, um, but they are where they are at the moment. But I liked what you said about it centers a positive process. And I think the D element does play a part in some of the negative connotations and the negative perceptions and languages. And it is about turning that around and the way you, you talked about it, about centering it and, and bringing out the change. Um, I found really useful and I've taken quite a lot away back, will be taking quite a lot away with me to go back to my team to discuss about. So I just wanted to say thank you. No, th and, and, and thank you for those um, kind words. I, I would say, um, just in terms, of, I, I note the comments about um, Canada um, as well. Um, I would say New Zealand, um, and I've been to conferences in New Zealand where the way that they, they open and, and, and they bring those tr traditions together are really important. I would also say, I, re I mean, some of you probably read this book. I, I recently read a book called Empire Land. And um, the, the thing that Empire Land, I think, does really well um, is, and it's, it's written by somebody, by a, an English Sikh, and he talks about his, his, his history and his background but he talks in a, a way that I that I haven't read anywhere else of the impact of empire on England and on the UK and how history is taught and how that culture and how that that is so rarely acknowledged or, and I think that's something that is, is to, to needs, needs to be thought about as well because we often think about the impact the impact of it empire on countries that, that were colonized but the impact on the colonizers and and, and on all of us I think as well is, is really important um, Vivian, we I think Vivian's question may need to be the, the final question because we're almost out of time, but please go for it, Vivian. Okay, and I'll be as, as quick as I can. Uh, thanks, Brian, for yet another excellent presentation, as all of them have been. Just a couple of, I'll shorten the, the thoughts. Uh, I, I Personally, I found your points about abolitionism uh, jarring in the sense that as a former civil servant and bureaucrat and whatnot, I find uh, talk of abolitionism very threatening um, or whatever. I really did like your, your points at the end uh, in, in relation to what can we do? Because again, I, I like to hear in these type of scenarios, well, you know, this is all very interesting, but what, what can we actually do? And Dave Ward, just to link it back, mentioned to what extent sometimes does law need to change? And I was at another, I participated in another we uh, webinar earlier on this year in relation to, um, it, it was called Writing a Wrong, and it was initiated out of Nigeria and the uh, proposed repeal of vagrancy laws in, 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 in various countries, which uh, disproportionately and overwhelmingly target the poor and the, and the impact that that has uh, has had for 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 many many years in in a whole variety of uh, of countries and really that spoke to your question as well about questioning the assumptions of the criminal justice system and uh, as i say i also really liked the other uh, practical suggestions that you had but really that starting point of questioning what you know what have we here what are we dealing with what are we part of and what can we do to change it and you know make it better so thanks yeah no, th thank you Vivian. i'll just respond to a couple of those points quickly the, the point about vagrancy laws i mean there's there's a horrible example in, in, in australia of, of a woman who died in custody who was arrested for being drunk on a train and um I, I, I would say there are no circumstances in which I would be drunk on a train in Australia and some, someone would throw me into a cell, but an Indigenous woman that um, that happened to. I, I'm pleased to hear what you said about the actions, because I think that's, that for me is one of the challenges with the, the abolitionist narrative, is it sometimes can feel so far removed from the reality for, for those of us who are in the roles that we play. And I think that we, I think, but there are still actions that we can take that, 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 is, that, that will, that can step towards that and, 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 and can show some support. And I think it's particularly that point about not not assuming that the way things are or the way things yeah. are be. definitely okay uh we do need to draw this to a close um uh, we've had a very good point again from james on the floor and james i'm going to put this as a comment rather than a question because we haven't got time to do justice to it but james has reminded us of the ways in which deconstruction 
uh, will be perhaps undermined by the fact that criminal justice now is a globalized industry. As Niels Christie used to say, with the more we privatize, the more we introduce market incentives, which will not be at all um, keen on the idea that we abolish the markets that they're trying to set up. Um, it's time to stop. And I just want to say thank you, warm thanks to everyone who's contributed. I think it's fabulous. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is that we have accomplished the kind of knowledge exchange that we were talking about. So Brian has acknowledged Kashika's valuable points and said he wants to take them back. Kashika in return has said how much she's learned from, from Jason and from Brian and how much that can be brought back uh, to informed uh, conversations uh, at, at De Montfort University. So this idea that we learn from each other and nobody seeks to dominate everybody, anybody else, I think has been amply modelled by the courteous and receptive way in which we've had this conversation today. Um, I'm really delighted that this is recorded and this will be available um, on YouTube and on the INCJ website. Uh, so that's something uh, to, to look forward to because so much there is, re would repay further study. Um, and I think the last thing I need to do is just to remind people uh, that the second seminar uh, will be taking place on uh, two weeks today, on Thursday, the, what is it, the 24th of June at two o'clock British time. Um, and of course, that immediately disenfranchises Jason um, and, uh, and Brian, who will be doing other things when it's uh, uh, 1400 hours BST. Um, Big thanks again to everybody and thank you to our audience for attending and for the questions that you brought to us as well. So much more to discuss. Thanks again. Time to stop. Bye-bye. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network. <laughs>